Greetings, friends of liberty. Tis clear from time immemorial that the French have been in a state of war against the Ranadai, frogs attacking frogs. The French would deny it, but the frogs, could they speak more than a ribbit, would tell a different story, pointing to the very evident and constant French hunger for their legs. Quis to Grenouille. But now the French appear to want to attack not just the Ranadai, but us as well, having declared war this February. At least we shall present, no doubt, a more formidable challenge to French arms and honour. But as a result, we shall see no end of soldiers and sailors convalescing from their French wounds in various lazarets and hospitals throughout the realm. In these, our nurses excel in performing the most essential duties. They prepare both the victuals and medicines and patiently feed them to the sick, dress wounds, they assist physicians with all matter of medical procedure, stem the progress of fevers, with their cooling compresses, empty bedpans, wash the dirty linens, and by their tender and solicitous administrations and smiles, encourage the men in their fight to regain their health and vitality. Now, does anyone imagine that the average man, as an orderly, could perform these duties in their totality, as well as the average woman? First, since men on average are taller, their hands are larger, but not as skilled in these dexterous procedures. Witness the fact that fine needlework of all kind is overwhelmingly done by women. Secondly, there are a fact that, by and large, men and women are at some level naturally attracted to one another, and that these soldiers and sailors are all men means that women treating them as ideal. Thirdly, women, as evidenced by their naturally skillful care of infants and children, as well as the aged, appear psychologically superior, possessing of a greater degree of natural compassion and empathy for infants and adults alike. Now, if we turn to the issue of the varying natural capacities of men and women in nursing and much else besides, in your own 21st century in America, we find an author today who has summarized the available scientific literature with clarity and diligence in the process separating many of feminist fiction from fact. I speak of Kingsley Brown, the lawyer and First Amendment scholar at Wayne State University in his book, Biology at Work, Rethinking Sexual Equality. In this, as good lawyers are trained to do, he distills vast quantities of the research revealing its essence. Brown begins by noting the vastly increased participation of women in many areas of Western society since World War II, with female participation in the American labor force having increased by about 50% in the two decades after 1960. And the percentage of female lawyers, doctors, and business administrators from 4 to 39%, from 10 to 24%, and 18 to 43%, respectively. And yet, as he says, many striking disparities remain. Women are sparsely represented at the highest level of corporate hierarchies. Many jobs continue to be largely sex-segregated, and female employees earn, on average, less than men. Why might, for example, 90% of bank tellers, receptionists, registered nurses, and preschool and kindergarten teachers still be women? One explanation, of course, is given by feminists who posit an alleged stifling and dominant Western patriarchy, with men manipulating society allegedly for their own crass advantage. 
Another explanation is proffered by sociologists and their standard social sciences model, which attributes human behavior largely, if not exclusively, to social conditioning. As expressed by the behaviorist John Watson back in the 1920s, there is no such thing as inheritance of capacity, talent, temperament, mental constitution, and characteristics. Instead, allegedly all behavior is conditioned by our training when young. The extremes of this view are allegedly even to apply to sex differences, completely erasing them. Should we believe this? with regard to gender differences or anything else? No, one reason being that parents who have tried to socialize boys with dolls and girls with guns consistently fail. In one case, with the boys ending up using the Barbie dolls as guns. Another reason are that those cases where, due to accidental penis castration, boys are raised as girls has utterly failed. Thirdly, if we look at the Israeli kibbutzim, and their attempts to treat both sexes the same, in their upbringing, we find rebellion, with, for example, women refusing to serve generally on governing bodies and insisting on raising their own children individually. Let's now proceed in the interests of science to examine what studies actually show in the domain of sex differences. Number one. Males, from a very young age, exhibit more aggressive, assertive, and competitive behaviors, especially towards other males. They also tend to take more physical and non-physical risks, dying, for example, at 1.9 times the rate of girls from accidental deaths in Europe. Females, also from a young age, tend to exhibit more nurturing behavior than males, paralleling the substantially greater maternal than parental involvement in childcare activities worldwide. As regards infants, males on average hold their infants for a total of 57 minutes per day compared to 490 minutes for mothers. Number two, men have a tendency to pursue more casual or short-term sexual relations, having a greater desire for sexual variety, for sexual intercourse after a shorter period of acquaintance, and relax their standards for short-term mates. Surveys in over 20 countries have confirmed that these popular conceptions indeed accord with the reality. In addition, A. Men tend to think about sex and how to get it more than women, with 54% of men saying that they think about sex at least once per day, compared to only 19% of women. B. 10 times as many men as women 17 to 1.7 percent have paid for sex or been paid for sex. Number three, competition and cooperation. Here the differences between males and females are striking. A, men tend to regard competitive experiences more positively, while women instead report higher levels of stress attendant to competition. B, boys engage much more in competitive games, while girls tend towards activities with turns, like jump rope, or in playing house. C, boys were much better than girls at competing against friends and cooperating with teammates whom they did not like, with one researcher in addition concluding that boys enjoy the rules disputes as much as the game. And four, in the presence of boys, girls tend to inhibit the expression of their ideas, and also some will depress their performance levels. Number four. Both boys and girls early on by age five like to segregate by sex, with the status and dominance hierarchies of the boys tending to be more clearly defined, while with the girls it fluctuates and, among girls, status tends to be achieved through physical attractiveness and friendship with popular girls. 5. With regard to unexpected challenges, males are more likely to select the more difficult task. Females tend also to be more adversely affected by failure and more likely to give up than males, and more likely to attribute failure to lack of ability rather than lack of effort. Number 6. Women want more feedback about their performance than men, and their self-esteem tends to need this feedback more. So, for example, sociologists 
have found that women especially disliked large introductory classes because they felt the professors did not care about them, they not getting much feedback in these classes. Number seven. Ironically, just as women don't like competing with men, men tend not to like competing against women. With Brown hypothesizing that in these cases, men may feel they will be criticized for playing to win against a woman and may perceive these encounters as no-win situations for them. Number eight. The best predictor of girls' willingness to take a particular risk is their belief about the likelihood of getting hurt, while for, for boys, it is the perceived severity of the injury. Not surprisingly, primarily men tend to be fisherman, logger, airplane pilot, structural metal worker, coal miner, oil rig worker, construction worker, taxi cab driver, roofer, and truck driver. Relatedly, of 676 acts of heroism recognized from 1989 through 1995, 92% were performed by males. Number nine, regarding empathy, women trounce men, displaying more of it in more types of situations and at all ages than men do. Number 10, importantly, as early as the first year of life, girls pay more attention to people and living things, and boys pay more attention to inanimate objects. This explains, for example, why of scientific careers in 1995, female PhDs are 12% in engineering, 12% in physics, 31% in chemistry, 41% in biology, and 64% in psychology. Now let's turn from psychological attitudes towards abilities. Number one, what reverberates throughout everything that men and women do and what should be generally noted is that, to my knowledge, with many abilities, men have a flatter distribution curve for ability than females. This means that with many abilities, there are more men at either extreme or either end of the distribution graph. So with intelligence, more men are morons and more men are geniuses. Again, because there are more men at either end of the curve and fewer in the middle. Women, in contrast, are more clustered around the middle. They are less variable. So, for example, there are approximately 20% more males than females among those with an IQ over 140. Similarly, males outnumber females by almost 2 to 1 in the top 10% of math ability with the American SAT math scores above 700 achieved by 13 males for every one female. Number two, regarding mathematics. Men have a slightly higher average score with women tending to do better at computing sums and males at understanding mathematical concepts. Number three, regarding spatial abilities. Among the spatial tasks favoring males are mental rotation, spatial perception, spatial visualization, and targeting. On the other hand, females do better than males in object location. Number four, males tend to do better at accumulating general knowledge, which is why, according to one online source, only 12% of Jeopardy tournament winners are female. Number five, males consistently outperform females on tests of mechanical ability, and this may simply be because women aren't much interested. Among 15 to 22-year-olds, year old year the sex ratio in auto and shop information in 1980 was approximately 66 to 1 in the top 10% and 464 to 1 in the top 5%. Number six, regarding science. Girls are more likely than boys to find science boring, an attitude that apparently continues into adulthood, with girls substantially more likely to participate in science fairs than boys, since this is more social, but less likely than boys to engage in science activity at home. Number seven, regarding verbal abilities. Women on average perform higher than men, being better at spelling, grammar, and verbal fluency, 
as well as performing better on tests of verbal memory. On one test, for example, male 11th graders scored at about the same level as female 8th graders. Let's transition now to understand how all these aforementioned differences can affect workplace interactions and performance. Number one. So when we're talking about CEO and company executives, do they need to take risks? Yes. So all things being equal, women will be at a disadvantage and there will be fewer female CEOs. Perhaps it's not surprising that tomboys are more likely to be CEOs. Number two. Perhaps as a result of this attitude towards risk and failure, women are more likely than men to work in the public and nonprofit sectors. And even within the private sector, they are more likely to hold staff jobs, such as public relations, than line jobs, such as running a plant. Number three. Given that women are more social and more bound to their networks of family and friends, they are less likely to want to move, which naturally hurts their ability to rise up the ladder of a company. Number four. Another factor, of course, is maternity leave, with it being unclear how many female execs will discover that they love being with their babies so much they'll do th that they'll decide not to return. That, naturally, dampening the desire of companies to consider women in leadership roles. As Brown says, a trip to many suburban country clubs on a summer weekday would confirm Many of those present will be mothers chatting amongst themselves while their children are pl off playing in the pool. These women will be former lawyers, investment bankers, and other professionals and executives. In addition, because men tend to earn more, stats show that while women were four times as likely as men to leave the workforce for at least a year, three quarters of these changes were due to the spouse's employment rather than maternity. Number five, regarding new businesses. Two out of three startup businesses in the United States are owned by women, and female-owned businesses are less likely to fail than businesses owned by men. The flip side of the low rate of business failure, however, is the tendency of businesses owned by women to be smaller and less likely to grow into large businesses. Number six, Women are less likely to work full-time than men, with, for example, self-employed full-time women found to average 35.3 hours per week compared to 44.6 hours for men. Number seven. Regarding the presence of women in high-end science, Brown points out two highly germane factors. Number one, the math intensiveness of the field and the extent of the field's social dimension these factors naturally increasing disparities. Number eight, if we start to isolate individual factors, such as sociability, that makes a job more attractive to women, it's no surprise that childcare worker, home economics teacher, community service organization director, and secretary are typically female jobs, while physicist, chemist, mathematician, computer programmer, systems analyst, and biologist are not. This, of course, directly contradicts the standard feminist explanation, which would explain the lack of female physicists, not because physics deals with inanimate objects, math, and is not very social, but instead because girls allegedly, when young, are channeled away from science. Number nine. When it comes to employment in blue-collar professions, Brown argues that women are, for a variety of reasons, more likely to face serious forms of harassment than in white-collar ones. Why is this? A. In dangerous professions, men recognize that women are more averse to danger and can put men more at risk. B. Women are physically weaker, having approximately one-half to two-thirds the upper body strength of men. This, too, may put males at risk, as, for example, in firefighting. C. Women are understood, in general, to have less mechanical aptitude, which may, at times, be needed. D. In addition, men tend to have the habit of to haze all newcomers, to a degree, which reaction women often regard as very unfriendly, while males are used to it, or at least understand it. Number 10. 
Men and women receive equal numbers of master's degrees, but women get many more in education, which is lower paying, thus partly explaining pay gaps. Does this matter? Yes. Physics majors had an average GRE quantitative score of 680 and GRE verbal score of 514, whereas education majors earn scores of 442 and 440, respectively. Number 11. In doing piecework on the factory assembly line, men earn 10 to 13 percent more than women because they are more willing than women to push themselves to the limits of their endurance to increase their pay. This is noted by supervisors. Number 12. In academia, the same results hold with men willing more than women do, I'm sorry, writing more than women do, typically about 50% more. Sex differences in publication rates tend to be smaller earlier, early in the career and grow as scientists get older. What causes many of these sex differences at an immediate biological level is a differential exposure to sex hormones, usually during pregnancy. No testosterone released by testes, no male development. On the other hand, too much exposure to girls by their mother's level of testosterone, higher than average spatial ability. And the same effect applies to many other traits, with girls exposed to excessive amounts of androgen being more tomboyish, not playing with Barbies, and joining the boys more than the girls when playing. Having set up his basic argument and surveyed the evidence for it, Brown now turns to derivative issues. Let me briefly list some of these. Number one, he discusses the famous theories of biologist Robert Trivers, that the more parental investment the male or female of a species makes, the more selective they will be in mating. Human females, of course, devote more parental resources to babies and thus are more selective in their mating strategies. Number two, Brown points out that feminists act as if a woman executive who has to choose between extensive mothering and a focus on her career has to suffer in ways that men do not. But men are faced with the same choices, and their constant working, more hours on average than women, also leads them to the misfortune of not spending as much time with their children as they would like. As Brown stresses, it's actually the women who have the broader range of acceptable socially sanctioned choices than men do. Number three, another feminist fiction he deconstructs is that while most men don't look down on their wives for staying at home with their children, many wives would look down to some degree on a stay-at-home husband. In fact, a red flag for divorce is when a wife earns more than her husband. This is corroborated by the fact that many rich women don't marry their boy toys, but instead usually find husbands who have even more money than they do, though they don't need it. As Brown says, women with six and seven figure incomes could easily find men willing to be supported. These men, however, would almost by definition lack traits that women find highly desirable in a mate, dominance, ambition, and status. In addition, Brown discusses the common contemporary notion that if some profession doesn't by its nature appeal to women, then something is wrong with it. So, for example, the president of the National Academy of Engineers has asserted that to the extent that engineering lacks diversity, it is impoverished. It is not able to engineer as well as it could. Similarly, something must be wrong with particle physics and even assembling computers by buying their own parts individually as many young men, but virtually no young women, do. Of course, if the percentage of nurses remains 90 plus percent female, nothing is claimed to be wrong with that. 5. Finally, in an extensive chapter on affirmative action, Brown mentions various court cases, such as a Department of Public Works case where, because women don't like A, outdoor jobs, and B, as much as men, and jobs involving machinery as much as men, they never much applied for the jobs. No matter, the first court and the appeals court found discrimination against fictional women who never wanted the jobs in the first place. 
In conclusion, this book is magnificently researched, argued, and written. I would give it an A. It was a pure pleasure to read and understand. Happy for my part, when previously injured in France to have been attended by one of the best English nurses in the world, my Marguerite, I bid you well and remain the Scarlet Pimpernel. <laughs>